Hello, I'm David Mandy, president of o and Partners in New York. I want to welcome everyone today to the Generation Mining Town Hall call. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, Generation trades on the Toronto Exchange under the symbol GENM. For you, those of you who are new to the broadcast, um, O&M is in the business of uh, bringing public companies and investors together in real time. The information presented is already available publicly. We're hoping that this broadcast will bring this information to your awareness, clarify context, and help you make a better informed investment decision. o and Partners is a communications company. We're not commissioned um, and um, take no money from Wall Street. This is a, a communications vehicle. Um, yeah, please feel free to chat in your questions through the question pane of the GoToWare webinar by email. We'll try to get to all your questions. If not, after the call, we'll come back to you with answers from the company. Um, if you called in by telephone, um, you will not be able to hear the first 12 minutes of the call, um, our introduction by Gwen Preston. Um, so please stand by or use the listen um, listen by computer option. Uh, before we turn to our guest, our host, I should say, Carrie Knoll, the Executive Chairman and Director of Generation Mining, we're, we're pleased to have Gwen Preston on the call with us. Um, start to give us kind of the overall view of, of, uh, of the Palladium market and what's exactly going on. Um, in the uh, in the category. Uh, Gwen is certainly the person to do it. Uh, she's a senior writer with the Northern Miner, um, spent, has spent years visiting projects, interviewing geologists, um, talking to analysts and management teams to understand the projects. Um, in the midst of these two years, uh, she spent two years, in the midst of all this, she spent two years with Casey Research where she learned more about the capital markets and the newsletter business. Um, she has a deep knowledge base. It's a real pleasure to have Gwen on the call. I'm gonna turn it over to Gwen now. Thanks for joining us, Gwen. Well, good morning, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us on the call here today. I am just going to try and give us a bit of an overview of the Platinum Group Metals market. I'm sure if you're on the call, then you are interested in the market and probably know a reasonable amount about it. So uh, I will keep this fairly brief, uh, but it's a pretty interesting space. It's a pretty dynamic space right now. Uh, and it's one with some very interesting investment opportunities as we are here to learn about today. So this slide's fairly obvious. This is the starting point of this discussion. It shows the platinum and palladium price charts for the last I think this covers 15 years each. Yes, 15 years each. And so the point, I mean, it says starting point. It is the starting point of this discussion, clearly, because these are very different price charts. Obviously, we have platinum, which went on this insane price run in the last precious metals market, gaining 450% in seven years. And that move really mattered because when a required component in a car part quadruples in price, car makers respond. They don't want to pay that much. And so they switched from platinum to palladium. And so you can see the result of that. The platinum price has declined steadily over the last nine years, while the palladium price has moved in the opposite direction. And of course, the, that price move got quite a bit more dramatic in the last year. And palladium is now uh, worth more than gold and a lot more than gold and is at all time highs. Okay, so why did that matter? Um, because this increase in demand from car makers, auto catalysts now represent 75% of the palladium market. So we went from very little to 75%. That's a huge increase in demand on palladium and supply just couldn't keep up. Most palladium is produced as a byproduct from mines that are primary nickel or platinum. As, as a, a good example is the fact that Norilsk Nickel is the world's biggest palladium producer. So uh, that in itself means 
the fact that the metal is produced primarily as a byproduct means that it is difficult for palladium to respond to price increases. We need the price to increase for nickel and platinum for those mines to start producing more. Then you layer in the fact that the, pl the platinum mines from which we get our palladium are largely in South Africa, which has been plagued with cost, power, and labor issues, and we have a palladium market that's been in deficit for eight years now, and a significant deficit. This isn't just a little bit missing, this is, we're now very short on palladium, and we have been for quite some time. And we don't have any solution in sight. I mean, the quotes that I have here, <clears throat> And there's no solution to this problem in sight. So JT Matthews is sort of the uh, leader in assessing the PGM market. And these two quotes, the, the, the quotes at the beginning of this slide are from them. The, pal the palladium deficit is likely to deepen in 2020 as key car manufacturers are required to comply with even more stringent environmental re requirements. And so that simply means more of the precious metal in those auto catalysts, and that's going to live, lift world automotive demand above 10 million ounces. Look at what I have circled on this slide, that is total supply, you can see that that's 6.9 million ounces. That's a big gap, right? Just auto catalysts alone need 10 million ounces, and gross supply, or total supply is only about 6.8 million ounces, 6.9 million ounces. That's the deficit that we're facing, and it's not going to change this year. Will it change in the long run? Yes. It will change for two reasons. First of all, there are new palladium projects and mines being advanced, expansions and operations, but those aren't really going to have an impact for another few years. 2023 is sort of when those mine expansions start to come online. Um, and over that same time frame, we are all sure that car makers will start switching back again. If platinum is going to be way cheaper, let's go back to using platinum or probably have some sort of middle ground, right? Where they use both so they stop pushing these prices in opposite directions. So that will happen, but both of those things take time. They are not going to have an impact this year. And so the palladium market is going to remain in significant deficit this year. <clears throat> what does that mean for palladium prices? It's pretty hard to predict that palladium prices are going to jump from here when we're looking at a price that has already moved from a thousand bucks to pick your price twenty two twenty three hundred dollars in the last little while so I'm not going to stand here and say that palladium is going to keep running what I am going to say is that we are in a new palladium price paradigm and that's a pretty hefty statement this is a long-term price or this is not such a long-term price chart but this looks back at where palladium has come from palladium was worth only was worth less than a thousand dollars an ounce for many many years now it's worth over two thousand dollars an ounce that's a new paradigm and that matters because it makes projects it puts projects in a completely different set of calculations in terms of whether they make sense now when we have prices that jump vanadium or molybdenum or at those prices jump you don't want to immediately start looking at projects and saying, oh, well, it didn't make sense at the previous price, but at this amazing new spot price, it makes sense. But when you're looking at a market that has this fundamental deficit that is going to persist for quite a few years and will only be solved by bringing new mines and new projects forward, you do need to incorporate a dramatic change in the pricing paradigm, which is what we're looking at with Palladium. It's happening because we need new mines, so let's use some more aggressive pricing when we're looking at mine, um, calculations. And so what this all comes down to for me is that um, the palladium fundamentals are very strong. The price has run, but we need new mines. That, that's the reason the price has, has run. And so it basically, for investors, it makes sense to have, in my estimation, project level exposure to the palladium market right now. I think the price is going to remain elevated for the foreseeable future, the next year for sure, likely considerably longer than that because I don't see the fundamentals changing until 2022 at the earliest, 2023 perhaps. So I think we're going to have an elevated palladium market for quite a few years. In that context, it's project level exposure right now that makes sense because 
palladium stocks have absolutely moved, but there just aren't that many to choose from. There just aren't that many projects that are advancing towards uh, mines and therefore could contribute to helping to solve this problem. So I think that project level palladium exposure makes a lot of sense right now. I do want to say what about platinum? This is, uh, I, I just want to address both sides of this. Well, if you look at this chart, um, you can see that in the last year, the price of platinum, which had declined for many years, uh, did start to recover this year. And the reason that it did that was investment demand. It was not from industrial demand. It was not from catalytic converters. It was from investment demand. And that was for two reasons. First of all, there was a sense that the price had come down so much there had to be an investment upside. And it was a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy because as investors moved in to take advantage of that potential upside, they created it by pushing the price up because they bought into platinum ETFs. Platinum ETFs then had to buy platinum. That helped the price gain. So they created a bit of their own um, uh, outcome, which is great. Right now, we're in a situation where we would need that to continue for platinum to have more upside in the near term. Uh, there is not likely to be uh, an, any growth in platinum. Uh, there, the, platinum is likely to remain in surplus unless we have sustained investment demand. Is that going to happen? It's tough to say. Um, I, uh, platinum definitely, platinum and palladium definitely track the precious metals market more broadly. And uh, as we record this today, on uh, on February 21st, we have a gold price that's almost 1650. We have a very strong gold bull market in action. So that will pull precious or pull the platinum group metals along with it because they are another classic way of getting that safe haven investment exposure. And so there may be upside in platinum from here, from the investment side of the story, but you only play platinum specifically if you believe in the investment side of the story and there's reason to believe in that but i think taking a step back the big picture answer here is palladium is where there's opportunity the opportunity sits on the uh, project scale so investing in companies that are advancing projects that have the potential to fill this long-term supply gap that we have in the palladium market the interesting thing is that most projects that have palladium of course also have platinum so in a sense you don't have to choose if you like the palladium story and you think there may also be upside in platinum well buying in at the project level gives you both of those opportunities in most cases because the metals coexist and this is all happening in the context of a rising precious metals market uh, that I think that would be another whole presentation but a rising precious metals market that has very strong fundamentals as well that supports the investment side of this story so all told, I think it makes sense for investors to have PGM exposure. I think that PGM exposure should be driven by palladium, and I think palladium project level exposure is what makes sense. Uh, I think there's not a lot of uh, – it's a difficult game to try and guess what precisely is going to happen with the palladium price from here, but it there's good reason to believe that we're in a new – price paradigm for palladium where projects that perhaps haven't made sense for decades now make not only make sense but are needed because that because of this deficit in supply that that has no near term solution so that's my overview of the market there's a lot of these topics that we could dive into in a lot more detail but i think that suffices for now so thanks very much for uh for your time today and if you have any questions please always reach out to me gwen at resourcemaven.ca or check my website which is resourcemaven.ca thank you gwen um, now we're going to turn to our host today is Kevin uh, Kerry Knoll. Kerry's the executive chairman and director of uh, Generation Mining. Uh, Kerry is um, um, a visionary company builder. That's the best way I can describe Kerry. He has co-founded several successful mining companies over his 25-year career, including Wheaton River, which was bought by Gold Corp, and Thompson Creek, acquired by Sentara Gold. 
Uh, Kerry's track record proves that those who are successful in the mining industry, building one company, they tend to do it again and again. Although Kerry was focused on gold for the first 15 years of his career, his greatest success came when he started focusing on the less sexy overlooked metals, such as molybdenum, lithium, and zinc. But he found his the most overlooked metal in palladium. Few in the investment community seemed to notice that palladium had already soared from $800 an ounce in 2018 to $1,200 in 2019, Kerry's instincts for value led him to the Marathon Project in Ontario, which is the largest undeveloped platinum project in North America. It's a pleasure to have Kerry with us, and I'm going to turn the call over to him now. Thanks, David. And uh, thank you all for uh, joining the webinar presentation this afternoon. Um, we're going to talk about uh, the Marathon Palladium project mainly in uh, in Northern Ontario that uh, Generation Mining acquired um, last July. Uh, there's a disclaimer at the start of the PowerPoint. Uh, you can read it in more detail online if you if you choose uh, on our on our website. So <clears throat> simply put, uh, Marathon Palladium is uh, is Generation Mining's um, certainly flagship project. We have a number of them, but it, it's the one we're focusing on, the one we're working on. We acquire, acquired a 51% interest in the uh, in this project, which is is the largest undeveloped Palladium project in North America last July. We purchased that from Savannah Stillwater, a South African mining company, a South African-based mining company, which also mines in, in other countries as well. They're the largest uh, platinum producer and the second largest Palladium producer uh, in the world. Um, we have an option to increase that 51% interest to 80%, and we can do that by spending $10 million on the prop project over four years. Um, we've already spent $4 million, and, and with our recent financing, we're funded to spend the other $6 million. So we actually expect uh, either this year or early next year to have that 80% uh, interest uh, earned. First thing we did when we got this project in uh, in July was uh, engage a firm to do uh, a new resource calculation on the three deposits on the property. And that, um, uh, we went back to first principles, uh, to the original drill core and drill hole data, rather than try to update or, or, or um, audit previous resource calculations, we decided to start from scratch. And um, in the measured and indicated category, which is the categories that you need to eventually turn into reserves when the economic calculations are done, um, we came up with 8.6 million ounces of palladium equivalent and uh, a, an additional 915,000 ounces of uh, inferred palladium equivalent ounces. So it's a sizable project by, any, uh, by anyone's um, uh, imagination. You, you, don't, uh, you don't find these very often and in fact, there are very few of these in the world, and that's one of the one of the issues we had when we originally started marketing this this project and raising money for it was trying to f get people to understand how rare palladium was. And uh, you know, one of the examples I saw was at last year's PDAC, the big mining conference in uh, in in Toronto, um, of, of hundreds and hundreds of booths at the at the investors exchange. Uh, there was only one company that uh, was was marketing any any palladium product and that was North American Palladium which got taken over last year for for around a billion dollars. One of the things that we loved about this property right from day one is the infrastructure and that's one of the the things that is is high on my checklist when we um, get get involved in a project. The um, the the project is right on the Trans Canada Highway. It goes, the, the, the main line of the CPR rail line goes right by the property. Uh, the government is building a major power line right over our property, uh, connecting uh, two different parts of Ontario. It's a 230 uh, kilovolt power line. And most important, we're right near the mining town of Marathon, Ontario, which supplies uh, the big Hemlo mine just down the highway from us. So we've got the infrastructure, we don't have to build that, and that's one of the things that was holding back a lot of different mining projects around the world, is they're waiting to raise the money to build infrastructure or have a government build infrastructure, get the permits to build infrastructure. Well, we don't have that. This is already 
already in place. So within six months of getting the project, in, in January, we announced uh, the results of a preliminary economic analysis. And for those of you that aren't uh, followers of, of mining projects, the, the usual uh, sequence is a preliminary economic analysis, which could be followed by a pre-feasibility study. And ultimately you do what's called a definitive feasibility study. And that's what you make your perfection decision on. So we did step one. Uh, and we announced that uh, in uh, January 6th, and the numbers w which I will talk about a little a little further on in the presentation were were very good, and it, it surprised the market, and uh, also talked a little bit about what the market uh, reaction was to that. Um, <clears throat> one last point uh, on this page is that we have uh, currently $14 million Canadian in cash um, as of February 15th. We also have some some uh, warrants that uh, from a previous financing that are well in the money and, and getting exercise. Um, so we're, we're well financed um, for everything we wanna do. We haven't finalized our budget for 2020, but uh, it's certainly gonna be uh, substantially less than that $14 million. So we're well funded uh, certainly for, for everything we wanna do this year. There's a breakdown when I talked about the 8.6 million ounces of uh, palladium equivalent and measured and indicated. There's a breakdown of the different metals we have. And uh, it's interesting uh, seeing what Gwen had to say that, um, you know, yes, we have 3.8 million ounces of actual palladium, but we've also got a pretty good uh, platinum credit as well. And not to mention uh, over a billion pounds of copper. And these are all metals, depending on what happens to cars, whether there's some substitution for platinum, uh, for palladium with platinum, or whether we get into more electric cars, all of these metals, have a spot in one of those different uh, one of those different outcomes. So I think we're pretty much covered whichever way the the car market goes over the next uh, several, several years. I was talking earlier about location. We're in a interesting spot um, right uh, just just off Lake Superior. We're about uh, 10 kilometers north of the lake, and it's uh, uh, it's it's a it's a lake that has had a long history of mining all around it. Uh, uh, the, the, there's certainly the big Hemlo uh, gold mine uh, down the road, which has produced about 25 million ounces. Uh, there's the white pine copper and the Lundin uh, nickel on the south shore and the big Keweenaw copper belt that produced 11 billion pounds of copper. There's the North American palladium mine uh, just up to the northwest that got taken over last year. So we're in a, in a pretty established mining uh, area, which is important. Uh, it's important for permitting. It's important for geology. And, and, and certainly it's, uh, it's important for us because it's, it's close to home. We're based in Toronto. It's not far. Uh, it's a very short flight to get there from Toronto. Uh, you can fly directly into the, into the mine. If you go onto the next page of the PowerPoint, uh, you can see on the bottom um, on the map there, uh, the Marathon Airport is literally surrounded by our property. And, and you can land on the, uh, at the airport and be over at the uh, mar main Marathon deposit uh, literally in minutes. So I talked earlier about the, the location being uh, near the town of Marathon. One of the important things about that for us is that uh, as the Hemlo camp is running out of ore, the gold camp, the uh, town has shrunk in size. It was 5,000 people, now it's 3,200 and, and, and declining uh, as, as Hemlo, um, the Hemlo workforce gets smaller and smaller. And as a result of that, the town has is, is become somewhat depressed. And, and the outcome of that for us is that the town's people, the mayor, um, the, the people we've talked to in the town are 100% are behind us building this mine. And uh, you know, for, for some of them have even indicated to us that they can ride their bicycles to work if we, if we build this mine, it's so close. So it's, um, it, it, it's really something that we, um, um, want to work with the town and work with the local native groups and we're, we're in discussions with them as well and that's going well um uh, lastly i and I, I mentioned the government's building this billion dollar uh, power line and that's going right over our property uh previous uh, studies on the on the project indicated that there may or may not be enough power locally uh to support this mine but with this new power line that uh, that issue goes away I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the project now. It's uh, it's been worked on for a long time by a lot of different people. Um, I was actually first on this property when I was a reporter at the Northern Miner in 1985 when I was covering the Hemlo discoveries. 
and I was up there uh, in in looking at it, and it was very low grade then, um, considering uh, palladium was only about two hundred dollars an ounce. I didn't think that it was ever going to go anywhere. And you know, shoot ahead um, thirty five years, and and uh, we own it. Um, it was uh, developed up until uh, two thousand and ten by a company that uh, really did a good job advancing the project. And um, that company was called Marathon PGM. And uh, they, them and other companies drilled uh, over a thousand holes on the property, uh, over 200,000 uh, meters of drilling. Stillwater took over Marathon based on all of that work in 2010 for 118 million US dollars. Then they turned around and sold 25% of the project to a Japanese um, smelter company called Mitsubishi for $81 million in 2012. In 2014, they redid the feasibility study and realized that it probably at $500 per ounce palladium, this probably was not economic. And they put it on the shelf. Uh, those of you that follow mining would know that Stillwater put everything on the shelf in 2014. And then in 2017, they were acquired by um, uh, uh, Sabani Gold and cha changed the name to Sabani Stillwater. That's a South African company. And again, um, Sabani did very little work on the project. Uh, we were able to um, make an offer in 2000 and er early 2019 to Sabani. And uh, the deal, we were able to conclude that deal in July. And uh, the deal is, as I mentioned earlier, we can bring our ownership to 80% by spending $10 million over four years, and we've already spent four of that. Sabani so does have a back-end right. Uh, it's, it's onerous, but they do have a back-end right. So they can uh, buy back, once we earn our, our 80%, they can buy back 31% on a production decision by putting up the first 31% of the CapEx. So, the cost of them purchasing back this 31% based on the numbers in our preliminary economic assessment are about 130 plus million dollars. So it's going to be very expensive if they want to do that. Um, I can't speak for them whether they will or not. Um, we're, um, we, our, our feeling is that we're fine either way because uh, if they do uh, back in, we uh, will get a 49% interest in a, in a good size mine for a lot less money. And if they don't back in, we're happy to, to push on and, and, and build the mine. One other point to make, and something that's unusual in today's, uh, in today's environment, is that there are no royalties on the main deposit. Our, our preliminary economic assessment was based entirely on the marathon deposit. It has no royalties. Um, I'll give you an example. The North American Palladium mine to the northwest of us had a 5% net smelter return on it. 5% net smelter return can actually amount to about 25% of the profits. Um, and, and, and therefore, um, us not having that gives us two options. One is, is that we can, if we raise the money, we can build, uh, build the mine ourselves and, and make more money, be more profitable than we would if we had a royalty. But the other option that we have is to sell a royalty or a stream, because there's a, been a real, uh, real boom on, uh, on streaming companies lately. And uh, for example, we could sell a stream on the gold or we could sell a stream on the platinum and keep the palladium for ourselves. And, uh, and we can fund part of our production that way. That, that's just an option we have. Um, we haven't really explored it. We've talked to a few of the companies that sell them, but we're not really uh, interested in doing anything until we have a feasibility study done. So the preliminary economic assessment, um, that was, uh, done in, I think, record time. We, uh, and the reason it was done in record time is because there was two feasibility studies uh, performed on this property um, at much lower palladium prices. The first one was done at $321 an ounce palladium. The second one was around $500 an ounce. And uh, so finally, at, uh, when, when palladium got up to uh, over, over $1,000 an ounce, we did a, our PEA. And we were able to do it fairly quickly, and, and we modeled it on a lot of the work the engineering work, the design work, and the concepts that were, were developed by previous operators. We didn't have to reinvent the wheel here. The PEA, as we call it, um, uh, came back with a 14-year mine life, uh, producing an average of close to 200,000 uh, palladium equivalent ounces per year. And, and the actual number of palladium ounces is about 105,000, and the rest is 
is the equivalence made up of platinum, gold, silver, and copper. Our uh, initial capital expenditure is uh, estimated at 431 million Canadian dollars. That's about 330 million US dollars. Our project um, at two-year trailing prices. Now, two-year trailing prices indicate a palladium price of $1,275 per ounce. As you know, palladium is nearly double that price today. But based on that much lower price, we had an internal rate of return of 30% in our uh, PEA and a net present value of 871 million at a 5% discount. What's interesting about that is that the, the net present value is nearly double uh, the CapEx, which you rarely see in the mining business. Um, it does happen, but it's rare. So that's a, that's a real uh, a check mark in our favor. What's really interesting is when you get to spot metal prices, and this is spot metal prices of December 31st, 2019, and I believe that the palladium price at that point was about just over $1,900 an ounce. That provided an internal rate of return of 45%, which is just amazing use of capital. And an after-tax after net present value of a billion and a half dollars, so so more well over triple the uh, the capex cost. And that's still at $1,900 an ounce palladium. Palladium is now at $2,400, $2,500 uh, an ounce. So very, very good numbers, very compelling numbers. Immediately that uh, sparked our, our decision to go ahead and uh, and take this project further. Uh, we're planning to, uh, once we get our team together, and when I say our team, I'm talking about our, um, our, our, our the engineers that are gonna see us through this next phase, um, and we're in the process of interviewing and hiring uh, them. Um, we will start a feasibility study, which we expect to be done this year, and uh, and that will really tell the tale um, of, of where, where this project is going. And we think the numbers are gonna be uh, similar to that in the PEA. And the reason we think they're going to be similar is because of the amount of work that's been done on this project in the past. We know, for example, that, um, um, you know, where the open pit is going to go. We know where the tailings is going to go. We know where the roads are going to go. All of that was done and surveyed in and and, uh, and engineered by previous, uh, previous owners of this project. One of the most compelling things about the PEA is the cost uh, we're going to be able to produce um, uh, palladium at net of byproducts. We're going to be able to produce palladium for just over $500 an ounce. And if you want to look at the uh, <clears throat> the all-in cost, which includes uh, uh, you know things like development and sustaining capital, um, that number is still uh, well below $600 an ounce. It's, I think it's around $585 an ounce. So we're going to be able to make uh, well, obviously at today's palladium price, we would we would really be able to make a lot of money. But on any foreseeable palladium market going forward, uh, I think we're going to be able to uh, ma make a really, uh, really healthy profit. I mentioned earlier that uh, when we put out the PEA, we got some some really nice um, a reaction from the market. And uh, what, what did happen in, in January is our share price tripled in a matter of weeks. Um, we had multiples of offers of financing. The trading volume in the shares increased by 500% from January over over the trading in December. Um, obviously, the news was was really well accepted by the market. Of course, we've we've had a few things happen. The price has come down a little bit since, and and, and one of the reasons for that, I I think, has to be pointed to the what's happening with the uh, the, the this Chinese virus that that's uh, uh, plaguing the world. Um, the 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 Ground zero of that virus was was a city in China where a lot of the cars are made, and those factories are are not operating right now. So you have palladium starting to come down in price, and and the palladium trading companies like Norilska, you know, they're coming down in price, and we've come down with them. But we, the longer term, um, that that's all going to get cleaned up at some point, and people are going to go back to buying cars, and they're going to go back to manufacturing cars in China. So this is a uh, what's called a, a, a cross-section. Um, it's a cutaway of the earth for those of you that, that aren't uh, in, in the mining business. Um, and the reddish area, brownish reddish area there is, uh, is the ore body. It's, um, it's, um, it's thick. It averages about 34, 35 meters thick. That's, that's a, well over 100 feet. It's, um, 
Uh, and as you can see, that jagged uh, line that uh, goes um, down from the, uh, the what's called the pit outline there is uh, a real indication of why the mine is going to be fairly low cost. Uh, and that's because you're only going to have to take about three tons of waste rock for every ton of ore when you mine this. And that's uh, that's a good number. It's called a three to one strip ratio. Uh, and it's 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 a it's it's better than most. Let me put it that way. This is what's uh, called a plan view, a site plan, and this is what it's going to look like uh, when it's in production. Actually, towards the end of the mine life, there's going to be three pits: uh, a small one in the middle, and a much bigger one to the north, and a, and a medium one to the south. Um, we're going to be able to. We've got a spot to put the waste rock right next to the pit, which is great because there's going to be about uh, several hundred million tons of that and we don't have to haul it that far away uh, and then the tailings are, are also not that far away a couple of kilometers and they'll be uh, run by conve conveyor belt and um, they'll just be stacked in that one in that one valley um, so it's all a very tight little project um, in terms of uh, you know where everything is it's not spread out all over the place like some of them um, the mine office and the shop and the plant are all going to be right side by each, uh, right right on the property. And the access road to the south there uh, goes right into into the town of Marathon, a few kilometers uh, off of this map. When we did the preliminary economic assessment, um, we left some things out, and, and we left them out for a variety of reasons. Um, one was because um, we were looking to keep our capital expenditure low. And also um, we hadn't done the permitting background work on two of the deposits and didn't want to trigger any requirements to do that work right away. So we only focused on the Marathon property. We only focused on measured and indicated resources, which is again, unusual for a PEA. We don't have to go into a pile of drilling to bring this into the into the measured and indicated category um, in order to do a feasibility study. We, we will do some drilling, but most of that has already been done. But uh, we only use 37% of the total resources on the property. We do not use the Geordie deposit or the Sally deposit. Uh, those will probably be mined later on in the mine life, uh, but they'll have to get obviously permitted separately. But um, so when we say it's got a 14 year mine life, we've actually got a lot more material to mine for a lot longer. One of the things that we're talking about doing, and we're talking with some of the trading companies about this, is locking in some of these high palladium prices early, before we go into production, so that we can take advantage of them. Right now, our payback period in our, our estimated in our, our financial projections is two and a half years. Well, if we could lock in today's palladium price, it would be between a year and a year and a half, we would pay back that entire $430 million. Um, so we're looking into that. We're talking to them. The upcoming PDAC convention, we're having some meetings with people to discuss just that. Uh, another uh, initiative we're taking is to uh, do some metallurgical test work. There's been a lot of developments in the metallurgical areas since it was last done eight years ago on this property. And we're going to see if any of those work on our, our rock. And metallurgical test work can improve the recovery. Right now, our recovery is about 82% of the palladium and about 89% of the copper. We'd like to get those numbers a little bit higher. Our numbers are not unusual for the business, but, but there are some companies that are recovering higher amounts, and uh, we want to see if we can do that because it, that's really just uh, uh, extra gravy on the, on the economics. It doesn't cost you usually a lot more to get higher recoveries. It's just the method that you use. I mentioned earlier that we have an option to sell a royalty or a stream because there's no existing royalties. Um, and one of the other things is that there, there, there is a, a, prop, a, a possibility that some of these 20, 15 to 24 million tons of waste rock we produce a year could be sold as gravel. There was a, a, a Vancouver Island um, had, a, had a quarry that they were shipping uh, gravel directly to San Francisco. Uh, so there is precedent for this. We're a lot closer to Chicago or Detroit or even Toronto than they than that uh, shipping was. And shipping is cheap. You can do it on barges. And cities like Chicago and Detroit, it is virtually impossible to get a permit for a new quarry in, in those uh, in those urban areas. 
So um, the waste rock, the, the gravel for those places has to come from somewhere far away as it is. We're on water. The cheapest way to transport anything is on water. Uh, there are dock facilities uh, in and around the, the marathon project. So uh, we will be looking at doing a study on that as well. And that could be, again, additional dollars that could go uh, in, into the bottom line of this project. And we've got some exploration, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later on uh, this afternoon. Uh, one of the things that has not come up in this conversation yet is rhodium. And uh, we don't know whether we will see any benefit from rhodium or not. Uh, one of the things is, is when we start mining here and, and, and milling our ore, uh, we're going to produce something called a concentrate, which we will sell to one of the smelters somewhere in the world. And the concentrate's going to have platinum, palladium, copper, gold, silver, uh, but it's also going to have about a gram of rhodium. And the gram per ton of rock doesn't sound like very much. But rhodium is trading at over $11,000 an ounce, which is about $350 a gram. And we're going to be producing 70,000 tons of concentrate a year. Um, the current financial models do not even concentrate us or, or contemplate us getting even 10 cents for rhodium. But we think that there's, there is, we know that some of the smelters do recover the rhodium and we are in a position, rhodium's at an all-time high. It's at, today it's at the highest price it's ever been in history. So we definitely uh, want to try to negotiate that. And that's, again, yet another thing that could add to the bottom line. And um, if we even got paid for 50% of the rhodium, which, which I, you know, I can't even speculate whether that's going to happen or not, but that would add $170 million to the bottom line over the life of the mine. That's over 10 million US dollars per year. When we look at trying to compare ourselves with other companies of our size, um, we kind of hit a brick wall because there just aren't very many other palladium companies. So uh, one of our, um, our, our companies that we, uh, financial companies that we work with uh, developed this slide and they compared us to the developing gold companies with which are in areas with access to infrastructure because that's that's a really important uh, aspect and they average about 72 dollars per uh, enterprise value per ounce uh, that they have in the ground well we trade at seven dollars so we're trading at uh, in, in palladium and platinum and is, is our precious metals like gold and we're trading at about 10 percent of the average of the the peers that we have in this uh, in this slide. So we do have a lot of room to move, even for us just to get up to the uh, the ones on the right hand side, uh, the TML and the MAX and the MOZ. Um, <clears throat> uh, we would have to get upwards of twenty dollars. So that would be a triple in our share price just to just to get up to that level. We also asked uh, one of the, the, the financial advisors to prepare one of the existing um, Canadian-based palladium companies. And as I said, there aren't very many. Um, this is them. Um, the gray areas show the inferred, which means they have a much lower, um, a, a much lower, um, <clears throat> what's the word I'm looking for? Um, much, much lower, possibility of that, that, that the ore is actually there, put it that way. And uh, the blue is a measured and indicated. And uh, of course, we're, we're much bigger than anybody else. And we still trade at less than the average of our peers. Um, we would have to almost double in price just to get to the average of the rest of the palladium companies, yet we're the most advanced. And the way for us to get there is to get out, we believe, and tell our story. And that's what we're doing. We're we have a major marketing push going on for the next four months, and uh, that'll include through the United States, through Europe, through Canada, pr presentation after presentation. Because we think when people hear our story and see what we're doing, there, you know, we think our, our share price will at least get up to the average of, of our peers. And here's a third table showing again similar things in a different way. This includes some of the much bigger projects, including the. North American Palladium, which is no longer around. It was acquired for a billion dollars. But it includes, um, for instance, Platinum Group Metals Waterberg Project and, uh, and the Platte Reef by Ivanhoe. These are some of the big palladium mines that are going into production. Um, and it, as you can see, we're still trading compared to our peers at, at a discount. We're, and this is going on, uh, the, the last slides were in US dollars. This is in Canadian. But we're trading at 950 an ounce, which is 
at the lower end of, of most of our peers. So again, we have some room to, to appreciate. So what's the plan going forward? Well, one thing I'm proud of is that in the first six months since we had this project, we did what we said we were gonna do. We said we were gonna raise the money to buy it. We were gonna raise the money to explore. We were gonna update the historic resource. We were gonna do the PEA. We were gonna apply for a new listing, which we have um, are, are in the process of doing. We're going through the process. I can't talk too much more about it, but we hope to have a, a, a much bigger listing um, in the next several months. Um, and then 2020, this year, um, two things that we're going to really focus on. We are going to continue our exploration, but um, uh, we, we haven't decided at what level. But the two main things we're going to do this year are a definitive feasibility study, uh, which will allow us to make a production decision. And we're going to restart the, at some point, we're going to restart the permitting process. And we're just, uh, we're just figuring that out right now. Uh, previous operator spent two years and tens of millions of dollars on studies for permitting. And the fortunate thing is that permitting application has never been stopped. It's only been postponed. Um, and we don't have to start from scratch. We can use the old reports that have been, uh, you know, whether it's water, groundwater, or whether it's wildlife studies or whatever it is, those reports have all been kept up to date. And um, we can just restart the process at any given time and therefore get permitted faster than just about anyone else. And uh, the new Ontario government that got voted in, I think about 18 months ago, uh, but by uh, the new premier, Doug Ford, and the new, the new minister in, in responsible for mining has said that he, one of his main goals is to improve the amount of time it takes to get a mine permitted in Ontario. So we've got a government that's pro-mining We've got a, a palladium price that's up. I mean, it's, the timing for this project is really, really, really good. So this um, outlines our capital structure. Currently, we've got 123 million shares outstanding with a market cap of about 74 million Canadian dollars. It's still very low on a, on a per ounce basis. Um, we've also got uh, some pretty smart people as our shareholders. When we bought this project off Sabani, they they did ask us if we could uh, pay a, a good chunk of the uh, purchase price in shares because they wanted to be a shareholder of us. And they still, they, they've kept those shares and they own about 8.8% of the company. Uh, Lucas Lundin, a mining legend, um, I believe he's been on one of your broadcasts, or uh, Lucas uh, Lundin Gold, uh, a week or two ago, uh, has in, been uh, participating in most of our financings and uh, continues to own 8% own of the stock. Uh, a very successful company, Osisco Mining, uh, also owns 8% of the stock, and they have participated in two of our most recent three, uh, three most, most recent financings. And of course, Eric Sprott, who's uh, one of the legends of investing in mining uh, around the world, um, he put in $5 million into our last financing uh, for 7.7% of the company. And the management and directors, uh, also, we own 6% of the company, and I'll say that uh, there was no founder stock in this company. The, the people, uh, the management and directors that own shares in this company all paid the same amount as investors paid. We participated in each of the financings as time went along. And so that 6% that we own of the company is is uh, is all bought and paid for. There was uh, It's a very common thing in Canada for new companies to hand out a lot of cheap founder stock or free founder stock. Uh, we We didn't do that. We, we think that uh, we should be paying the same as everyone else. And that's what we've done. And who are we? Well, um, Jamie Levy, who's, who's in on this call, is, is uh, Jamie is president and CEO. And I've been working with Jamie for seven or eight years now. Uh, we founded a company uh, together called Pine Point Mining. And I got into the zinc business in 2016, or I think it was 2016, and uh, got taken over by Osisco Mining in early 2018. And in fact, Generation Mining was the spin out of that company. Um, myself, my own background, if I want to toot my own horn for a minute, um, I founded uh, in uh, 1987, I founded a company called Glencairn Gold. Uh, in 1991, uh, Wheaton River, and I had, I had business partners. That I wasn't alone in this, but, um, and those two companies uh, went on to, to both be very successful gold mining companies. We founded a company called uh, Thompson Creek in uh, 2004 got into the molybdenum business, um, famously went from 10 cents to $24 a share, 
uh, got listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, so we've had lots of different success stories in, in, in the mining career. Uh, not every deal has worked out and nobody's, <laughs> nobody in the mining business has had every deal work out. That's the nature of mining. But, but one thing I will say of the six companies I've founded, all six have been taken over at one point. And four of those six got into production. And that was junior from a junior mining startup. That's, that's a really unusual st statistic. Uh, just adding to, to our team, uh, Rod Thomas is our, our VP Exploration. Rod was used to be president of the PDAC. Uh, Brian jo Jennings just joined us, uh, is a CPA. Um, he's run several junior mining companies himself and was a former vice president of Ernst & Young. Um, and and then the and, and I, I'm not going to get into detail on our entire team, but we we do have a really good team of people. And of course, governance is is hugely important in the mining business. And uh, I think we've got uh, uh, a very strong board of directors. I mentioned uh, Rod and Jamie and myself, but uh, there's four independent directors. Uh, Cashel uh, Cashel Meager just joined us. Cashel is senior vice president and chief operating officer of Hud Bay, a multi-billion dollar company and a company that is, is, is built mines recently. So he's got that experience. In fact, he built one of their, their big mines for them. Uh, Stephen Reefer, who's a geophysicist and, and, and uh, president of one of the most uh, well-known geophysical companies in the world. Paul Murphy, who's chairman of Alamos Gold, a billion dollar plus uh, a gold mining company. He was also chief financial officer of Guyana Goldfields. And he was head of the mining group uh, in, the, in the entire Western Hemisphere for Price Waterhouse Coopers. And uh, not last but not least, uh, Phil Walford. He was uh, is, is a geologist, uh, was CEO of Marathon Gold, which is developing a very promising uh, gold deposit in, in Newfoundland, Canada. Uh, but he was also president and CEO of Marathon PGM when this company was sold to Stillwater back in 2010. So Phil has has a, a actually about a 27 year um, uh, a, a worth of experience with this project. He's he's seen it he's seen it from when it was a lot smaller and and a lot <clears throat> a lot more difficult to develop when 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 prices were a lot lower. So he's he was very happy to uh, to be invited on to our board. This is a <clears throat> a rock. <laughs> And this rock is uh, something that we found on the property, or we didn't find it. It was actually found by uh, um, by Sabani a, a year uh, or two before we uh, before we got involved. But what's interesting about this rock is, first of all, the grade: 188 grams of PGMs, platinum group metals. So that's platinum, palladium, rhodium per ton. Uh, Nine percent copper. I mean, this is a super rich piece of rock. What's really interesting for us is that this rock, we don't think, came from one of the deposits on the property. It's it's massive sulfide, which is different than um, the kind of rock that we're mining. And um, a lot of very smart people who've looked at it and, and looked at this property think that there's a pretty good possibility that it was it was transported from somewhere down in the earth uh, during one of the volcanic eruptions that took place that, that formed our deposits in the first place. And they were formed a little over a billion years ago. And so as a result of that, we're looking for the origin of this rock because it's very possible that there's a very, very high grade deposit somewhere down below. And we're doing geophysics. We did some last year. We've done, uh, did some the year before. Uh, Savani did some before we, we got involved and we've generated some drill targets and we hope to be drilling those this summer and looking for the origin of this rock. So again, we don't need any additional ore bodies. As you saw, we we're only using 37% of what we have for our, uh, our economic analysis. But if we can find something that's a really high grade deposit, that would be again, yet another game changer for, for, for this project. So that concludes the, uh, the main part of the presentation. I think at this point we can start talking about uh, okay. Uh, the question and answer period, and I'm here. Thank you, Kerry. Thank you, Kerry. Great, great presentation. We'll go to asking questions now. Um, we're going to start with Doug Loud. Doug, questions today for Kerry. Since one of my favorite questions is what is the status of the permits, I'm glad to hear that you're well along in, in the wonderful world of permitting. 
how long do you think it is before your permits would come alive? Well, um, as, as I'm sure you know, um, a mine requires about 100 permits. Yeah. You need permits for everything from sewage to road building to putting in culverts to uh, environmental to tailings, disposal, waste rock, etc. You need a lot of permits. But there's two main permits you need. And, and there's an operating permit and there's an environmental uh, impact study that you need approved by the government. And those are the ones we're going to be focusing on. And uh, I can't give you, and I will never give somebody an absolute timeline on permitting because um, permitting is something that, that it, it just, as, as you know, takes on a life of its own. What I can say is that where we are in Northern Ontario, in the, in the Western part of Northern Ontario, a number of mines have been permitted recently. Um, a mine started up not far from us, Heart Gold. There's mines in Red Lake that have been permitted. So we're in a position where um, the government and the people we're dealing with have permitted a number of mines recently, number one. Number two, um, this mine does not produce much in the way of acid rock drainage or uh, of any other things, uh, sulfides that go into the, into, the, um, into the water, into the rivers that cause long-term problems. And they're the real stain that mining has had over the years on, on the environment. We don't have those those issues. So again, I think for those reasons, our permitting time will be relatively short. Um, our goal, our goal is to get it done within a couple of years and be, be, be building the mine within a couple of years. Um, I, and I think it's achievable given that uh, Stillwater has uh, in the past already spent two years on it. Um, I think, I think we're going to be able to do that, but I don't hold me to it because you know, governments come and go and uh, bureaucrats come and go and... and no, I, I understand. Are, is Mitsubishi still have that interest? No, no, they got, uh, they, they sold that out. So when, when it was apparent that the mine wasn't economic um, uh, in 2014, um, they, and, and that was just around the time that Palladium uh, went from uh, a surplus into deficit, it didn't, didn't look that promising because it was in a surplus for so many years because it was getting produced as byproducts of other mines that it was getting produced anyways. So there were all these stockpiles. Uh, the Russian government had a big stockpile. Uh, a lot of the, uh, the uh, South African mining companies had stockpiles. Um, so Mitsubishi just sold out. So they're gone. Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you for the uh, honesty about the permitting. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. We're going to turn to uh, Glenn, Glenn Galata. Glenn, do you have a question today for Kerry? Okay, we'll pass. Uh, we'll go to Heinz Toma. Heinz, do you have a question today? I saw you on the call. Interesting project, uh, Kerry. Uh, just a quick question. This would be uh, an underground mine, I would imagine. No, this is open pit. Oh, pit. Yeah. And in fact, uh, it's got a very low strip ratio, so it's uh, definitely open pit. Our grades probably wouldn't be economic underground, but um, they're, they're definitely economic open pit. So, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Heinz. We'll turn to Henry Eversoll. Henry, do you have any questions today? You're on the call. Henry? Okay. We'll turn next to uh, Victor Zhao. Victor, do you have a question today? No question, thank you. Okay, thanks for being on the call. Uh, we'll turn to Rolf Wagner. Rolf, do you have a question? Anything come up for you, Rolf? We're low on questions today. Jonathan Tierman, Jonathan, do you have any questions? Jeez. Okay. Uh, Scott, any call questions come up that we have that have come into the call? Yeah, we have a few. Um, let me pull them up real quick. Uh, first one is when could we anticipate a transfer of the listing to the TSXV? Um, we're looking at different options for our listing. Um, and we've we've applied for them, and we're deciding which one we're going to wind up going to. Um, we're hoping that that takes place in less than eight weeks. Oh, wow. oh great, great. 
Uh, another question, a short one. Um, it says concentrate to Norilsk, question mark, palladium, platinum, gold, silver, copper. So I think it's about, is that where you're taking the concentrate? So we haven't decided where the concentrate is going to. Um, there are uh, more than 100 copper smelters in the world. Um, I've, I'm pretty much doubt it's going to Norilsk because Norilsk is going through an expansion right now, and I think they're going to need all of their uh, all of their capacity. Uh, there's 20 uh, copper uh, uh, smelters in China, and of course China doesn't produce any of its own uh, palladium, so I think there will be a lot of interest there. The closest smelter to us is the Horn Smelter, which is owned by Glencore in Quebec, so that's a possibility, and they do process. Uh, uh, platinum group metals importantly so um, it has to be one of the copper smelters that actually recovers platinum group metals and that one does so that would be our uh, as far as transportation goes our best option but again um, we're going to go wherever we can uh, get the best price uh, plat um, North American Palladium was selling theirs and I don't know if they still are but they were when they were a public company was selling theirs to uh, both uh, their nickel concentrate was going to Sudbury we don't produce a nickel concentrate and their copper was going to the to the Glencore facility in Quebec. So um, we will be talking to them. In fact, we're meeting with some of the uh, smelting companies uh, during the upcoming PDAC convention in, uh, in in early March. And so we're already talking to them, even though we're, we're a little ways off from production. Great, thank you. Um, here's another one. What is the political support uh, in the area because of the potential for job creation? Can you talk about the support that you might have? So um, there, there, there's, I guess there's three sides to that, uh, three answers to that. The, first of all, there's the, the local, the town, the town itself. And we've met with the mayor, we've met with the council, we've met with a lot of the, uh, the, the people in town. We've had a open town hall meetings, uh, literal town hall meetings, and um, very, very supportive. Uh, just, in fact, no opposition that we have heard from. Um, it's a mining town and it's a dying mining town because the one mine that uh, that supports it is is starting to run out of gold and so they're they've been laying people off so the people want to stay they want their kids to stay and so they they uh, they support it uh, second group that we n need to work with is is the uh, first nations the the, the, the the natives and they um, uh, that was our first meetings when we first got the project and we went up there and we sat down with the, the six different groups, one main group, which is nearby, and there's six in the in the region. Um, and we met with them. Um, they are very supportive. Uh, they they want to know exactly what we're doing. They want to make sure we're not going to provide any or, or, or uh, do any long term damage to the environment and, and all good things and all fair things. But uh, uh, they're, no, they're not opposed to mining as long as they're, they're part of the conversation. And we made them part of the conversation from day one and want to continue uh, to continue those negotiations. And we want to have a, a, an actual operating agreement in place uh, sometime this year with, with the native groups. The third one, of course, is, is, is the province and, and, and ultimately also the federal government. And like I say, uh, this went quite a long ways uh, through that process with them. There was no, uh, the, initially there were some issues. Uh, when they first went to try to permit this, they were planning on putting all the tailings, which is the, the waste rock, uh, uh, they are planning on putting it in a lake. And uh, that kind of has gone by the wayside in Canada today, even though some people would argue that it's the best thing to do. Um, as a result, um, um, that was changed and, and a more traditional tailings facility was designed. Um, but other than that, um, we think that we're going to have the support of the government of Ontario, the people of Ontario, certainly in the north. Uh, the, the main economy in northern Ontario is still mining, um, so you know we're going to be we're going to be part of that. Great, thank you. Uh, here's another one. How are you guys able to acquire such a valuable project so cheaply? Well. <laughs> We get asked that quite a lot, actually. Um, I think, I think that this was a project that was in, in forgotten, and it was in a lot. A lot of people, uh, uh, um, people weren't paying attention to it. People, 
hadn't triggered that the palladium price was was going into what Gwen called a, a new a new phase. Uh, it, it people just didn't realize it, and I think Sabani, who was selling it, had had made a decision, unbeknownst to us when we approached them, but they had made a decision to sell a lot of their exploration projects. And um, at the time, they they weren't really advertising it. I think they told us they went to. Uh, to one of the big world financial firms office in, uh, in, in uh, South Africa. And they said they didn't know of any buyers for a project like this because in South Africa, they mine much higher grades, but, but very deep underground. And they, the, the open pit side of this hadn't really, uh, there are no, to my, to my knowledge, there are no open pit palladium mines anywhere in the world. So um, th this was just kind of unusual. So um, they entertained offers. Um, and this was last, uh, I guess this was in March last year and um, we were the highest offer. And that was that. Great, great. Uh, I have another one here. Um, given everything that you've told us that's so wonderful today, um, can you explain why you think the share price hasn't jumped even more? You kind of answered this one, but I don't know if you have another comment. Well, I think, I think uh, I think it's a lot of things. Um, when we go out marketing, and I don't know how many people on this call have heard of us before they got the email to be invited onto this call, but as we go around into the United States and into Europe and across Canada, and we, we just, you know, it's 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 a lot of time and to to do that. Um, and as we go around doing that, we find that almost everyone we meet has never heard of us before. So. It's our job, I think, to get out and tell the story better than we have been um, and to continue doing that. And that costs money and it costs a lot of management time, but I, uh, we are gonna continue to focus on it. We've obviously had a very, very busy six months, um, you know, getting all, accomplishing what we've done in, in, or in seven months now since, since we got this project. But um, yes, we have to just get out more and tell the story more. And I think that the market will appreciate it. And I think, also, I think uh, part of it is is that people have seen palladium jump so fast that they're they're probably concerned that uh, that it it, it hasn't uh, um, you know that it that it might come back down. So uh, we think that yes, it, of course it could come down, but we think that the fundamentals for a a, a palladium price north of fifteen hundred dollars an ounce are in place for a very very long time. Well, Thanks. you're doing a good job of getting out there today, Carrie. Um, got a good group here. Um, I'm going to turn back to Doug Wow. Doug, anything we missed today before we proceed to close? Doug has anything? You got to unmute Doug, please. Hey, Doug, doing some really good stuff, and it's very interesting. And um, I shall pay a lot of attention. Thanks. Thanks, Thank Doug. Thanks, Doug. Terry, I'll turn back to you for closing remarks. Well, I just want to thank everyone for taking the time to uh, to hear the story. Uh, please contact us if you have questions. Um, if you're at the PDAC conference, uh, come by our booth. Um, and uh, if we come to your city uh, in our rounds, um, you know, watch. We're going to be posting our, our our different presentations on our website, and uh, just watch for it. And uh, you know, you're welcome to come and hear the presentation, meet us in person. Thank you, Kerry. Thank you for presenting today. And I want to thank everyone for your presence on the call and wish you a pleasant evening. Take care. Thanks.